makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Stocks struggle for direction after big tech dragged the Nasdaq lower. There are signs of strength in the U.S. labor market. The U.K. prime minister suffers a double defeat, losing two conservative seats in special elections, but avoids a whitewash. The pound gains on stronger-than-expected retail sales. Plus, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission pauses its trial against Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard, Later, we'll be speaking to the UK regulator standing in the way of the takeover. Now, let's take a look at the European markets map. There is quite a lot of uh, news going on and actually a Bloomberg scoop on the BOJ saying for the moment they will not tweak uh, any yield curve control. Now, this is maybe because otherwise it sends a message uh, that uh, they are ready to abandon it. And so for the moment, this is a nice Bloomberg scoop that's moving yen. We'll get onto that in a second. Reminder, it is a huge, huge week next week. We not only have central banks, but we have around 250 trillion worth of company stock actually uh, coming out with earnings. Today you can see there's this pull uh, as markets look for direction with the Fed after that data from the U.S. And again, if you look at the earnings, a lot of them beat, but when they did not beat, and there are certain sectors that are doing worse than others, then it's a real drag lower. We need to talk about the yen after that Bloomberg scoop, and then we also need to talk about the Nasdaq, because we're seeing this out-of-cycle rebalancing. So let's start with yen, 141.44. I cannot wait to speak, of course, to our MLive reporter, Noor Al Ali, about this to really try and understand the psychology of the new governor of the BOJ and why he's uh, saying and pushing back against any kind of tweaking of yield curve control right now. The other story, of course, we're watching is what's going on with the Nasdaq. So because we have options probably uh, finishing off today, with, of course, this rebalancing, which is quite out of cycle. We're expecting some exacerbated moves that we've seen also for uh, the last week or so. S&P futures, NASDAQ futures, you can see down for the NASDAQ, up for the S&P 500. And then this is really the story that I think will take a lot of time uh, for people to understand what the longer term implication is. So the NASDAQ has been worried that they rely really on seven stocks that are huge and that weigh almost too much in the index. And so they're changing, they're trying to change that actually magnificent se uh, seven accounting for most of the NASDAQ surge. And so there's an out of cycle rebalancing. And that, of course, will have an impact on portfolio building now. To talk about all of these stories, we're now joined by Bloomberg's Markets Live editor, Nor Alali. Nor, you were about to come on, and then the BOJ um, basically telling our reporters or, or Bloomberg sources said that the BOJ is not ready to, to tweak. Are they worried that if they tweak, it sends the wrong message? Yeah, potentially. I mean, if you take a step back and you see what's happening in the global picture, you're seeing inflation easing in the UK, in the US, and that's sort of feeding into Japan, which is a big trading partner uh, with these economies. So definitely something that, you know, the dovish central bank governor in Japan is looking at. But also, when it comes to Japan, inflation still remains higher than target. No. What that means for markets, though, is more volatility, as we're seeing in options, options trading. Now, I was in Sintra in Portugal, and it was incredible. You had, like, the, the five, you know, most important central bankers and it was really quite lonely if you're the BOJ trying to kind of do the complete opposite of all the others. How do you measure success if you're BOJ governor? Well, you make jokes, right? <laughs> As they did uh, on the panels there. But also, you look at your economy in a very different way than you look at uh, potentially the U.S. and in the U.K., which are, you know, very different and idiosyncratic uh, stories there. But in Japan in particular, you do have a scenario where the yen is really pushing against what the Bank of Japan likes to see. You know, obviously, uh, the issues with Japan there are with inflation staying a little bit higher than target. It did come in lower than expected earlier data out of Japan, the, the data that we had today but at the same time you still have an economy that's much more immune to what we've seen in the global picture in terms of those inflationary and supply and troubles so we have some expectations next week that the Bank of Japan was obviously going to amend its yield, cor uh, yield curve control we've seen earlier reporting just a few minutes ago that goes against it but predominantly the market is still expecting no. to, uh, the Bank of Japan to, to remain in line with the status quo uh, Nor, so you, so you, you know, beautifully write about the markets every day. When you look at what we've heard so far, it's earnings, a picture, I think, about 60% beats expectations. The ones that haven't done so well are really getting slammed. Next week, I mean, it's crazy. Everyone's reporting, especially on the S&P 500, and we have central banks. What will drive these markets forward? 
it's a lot of volatility going forward, right? And remember, in summer trading, we have thin volumes, so they really pick up that volatility, and it becomes, and those moves become a lot more outsized. So you see larger moves, you see larger size and scopes of moves in the indexes that we haven't seen in months, and that that ties to the, a lot of the uncertainty that we've been driving in the markets currently. You know, we're in the current blackout period for the Fed. You're seeing the dollar really struggle in the absence of that hawkish guidance. I think also out of China, you're seeing a lot of that data come in. You're seeing more. Uh, stepping up of efforts from the PBOC to, to stimulate its economy, although it's a lot more isolated, though earnings still not responding to those recessionary fears that we're having so far this year. And I think we're seeing that lag defect probably coming into the next quarter. So while earnings are doing very well this, you know, this quarter, I think the impact or that feel of those recessionary concerns are coming in next. So I'll be looking forward towards the forward guidance of those companies to see just how optimistic they are. Yeah, and also let's take stock on technology. Uh, just one second, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission has paused its in-house trial against Microsoft's $69 billion acquisition of game developer Activision. Now that opens the door to potential settlement talks. Joining us for more is Bloomberg Tech reporter Aggie Candrell. So Aggie, good morning. What more do we know about the FTC's pause on its in-house trial? Yes, yeah, so this was a trial set for August that was going to be to, uh, to assessed by an in-house judge from the FTC. Um, the concern is essentially around um, whether or not this deal is compliant. This is the same with all, that we've also seen in the UK. The UK authorities took a stance against the deal back in April. And we're also seeing from, from the US side now that essentially now we've opened, the, the FTC has opened the door for Microsoft to try and get a settlement from the FTC to try and convince the authorities that this uh, that they would be able to go forward with this deal with Activision in the UK they've also managed to they've also decided Activision and Microsoft to extend their merger agreement until mid-October until October 18th in an effort to also come to an agreement with the UK authorities so what we're really seeing here is these companies are really doubling down on trying to make sure that this deal works and it's also maybe a sign for other people looking to make deals at the moment that if you really put in the effort and maybe pay the right lawyers, you can maybe get what you want. So overall, not a good time for tech though, right? I mean, this also comes in a, complex, in a complex, I guess, where we wonder about the rally and what comes next. Yes, uh, so we've seen a rally in tech um, despite uh, huge job losses um, earlier in the year. We've seen a rally in tech as people have managed to double down on narratives around AI and focusing on investment in new forms of technology like generative AI. And that's seen a real boom in tech. But as we see the earnings coming in now for the second quarter, uh, there is a concern that potentially some of that initial excitement around new technologies is, is, is maybe a little... Um, uh, premature and they're waiting to see where this goes and so there is a fear in the market it seems that the tech rally may have gone too fast too far. Aggie, thank you so much. As always, Aggie Cantrell there with the very latest on, of course, Activision, but also the rally in general. Still with us, Bloomberg's Markets Live editor, Nora Alali. There's a lot going on <laughs> when it comes to tech. So not only do we wonder about the rally, but also there's this NASDAQ reshuffling, which is out of cycle, and then a couple of options expiring today. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to add to the volatility that we're expecting. We saw the NASDAQ 100 really, like, in anticipation of today, really drop to levels that we haven't seen in, in, in quite some time, right? And that gives you the perhaps it's a lot of positioning in place. Also, you have a lot of big caps that are in the NASDAQ 100 that are being affected by this today. And so that's something that's going to really drive the market sentiment today, though I anticipated some more adjustments into the next week and into the next quarter, because if you're tying in a Fed uh, easing its tightening cycle, you're, a lot, you're probably a lot more optimistic about tech than you are um, other, other sectors as well. Nora, thanks so much. As always, Nora Alali stays with, of course, and we'll also get her thoughts on the UK. Coming up, a setback for Sunak. The UK's governing party loses two of the three seats up for grabs in parliamentary by-elections. While we discuss what it means for the Prime Minister, that's next, and this is Bloomberg.
Welcome back, everyone. Now, Rishi Sunak's Conservative Party has suffered a major setback, losing two of the three seats up for grabs in parliamentary by-elections. Well, joining us now is Lizzie Burden, our UK correspondent. Uh, good morning, Lizzie. So uh, take us through these results. Well, two thumping defeats for Rishi Sunak. So he's lost Selby to Labour. That one's particularly embarrassing because it's so close geographically to his own seat in North Yorkshire. He's also lost Somerton to the Liberal Democrats. Uh, and that one is by an even larger swing than Selby. So it illustrates the challenges at two different ends of the country from two different angles, the, Labour, the Liberal Democrats and Labour. But it wasn't a total whitewash because the Conservatives did manage to hold on to Uxbridge, which of course is the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson's former seat. But in that case, it might more have been to do with local factors. If you're a Londoner, you'll know that there's this extension planned of the uh, ultra-low emission zone, which has been quite controversial, proposed by the Labour Mayor of London, City. Sadiq Khan. Nonetheless, it underscores just how difficult the path is going to be to the next general election for Rishi Sunak. We understand at Bloomberg that that's going to be November 24, because that's when uh, Rishi Sunak thinks that the economy will be on a better footing. But there was some bleak analysis from, analysis from the polling guru, John Curtis. He said that replacing Liz, Liz Truss with Rishi Sunak doesn't really electorally seem to have made much difference at all. Lizzie, thanks so much. Lizzie Burton, our UK correspondent. Now, we also get retail sales from the UK this morning, which got a boost thanks to a hotter June than expected. Now, for more, Dan Hansen, Hansen our senior UK economist at Bloomberg Economics, joins us. And Nur Alali from the Markets Live team is still with us. So thank you for sticking around. And welcome to the program, Dan. I love it because every time I'm in a BOE like presser, they say, well, you should have listened to Bloomberg Economics because they get it right. So first of all, where are we in terms of how many rate hikes you're still expecting from here? OK, yeah, so from here we're, we're expecting one um, in August. And I think there is a, there's still a really big debate about the size of that. Yeah. So is it going to be 25, is it going to be 50? Um, and then beyond that, we think there'll be a hike in both September and November, so a peak of 575. What does that, how does that compare to the market? The market's between 575 and actually a little bit closer to 6 now, um, particularly on the back of that retail sales data. Um, but it has obviously moved down significantly. We were talking maybe two weeks ago about six and a half. We've come down maybe 75 basis points from that. So it's quite a significant shift, but there's still, there's still work to do. But that, when you look at the inflation figure, that was really a surprise or a welcome relief. It, it, when can you say it's really peak and, and that actually it's, you know, it's not a blip, but it's the interest rate hikes that they've done so far that are starting to take effect? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think, I think the really key thing about the inflation number, and you're right, it was really good news, and there was good news on the core side as well, and that's that sticky bit that, that, we're, that the Bank of England worries about. The key thing to, to look at, though, is that even though the headline number is in line with the Bank of England's forecast from May, which seems like a lifetime ago now, the composition of inflation isn't as favourable. So it's fuel prices, it's food prices that have done the heavy lifting and bringing inflation down. Services inflation, the sticky bit, is still high and it's higher than the bank's forecast. So that's why we think they're going to carry on going and hiking. So it is good news on, in a headline basis. Underneath, it's not quite as good news. There's still some stickiness there. OK, so uh, Marin Talks Money is a wonderful podcast. And they also spoke to the former Bank of England uh, governor. Of course, he's Mervyn King. This is what he had to say about future interest rate hikes. And I think it's quite possible that having lost control of inflation, and therefore, having lost a good deal of credibility, that central banks will see that, that the safest course for them is one of overkill now, so that they do bring inflation back to 2%. And if they carry on for the next six months or so tightening monetary policy, it could well be that they generate both a recession as well as a, a sharp fall in inflation. Nor is there a danger that actually there's over-tightening, again, because it almost goes really to the credibility. Like, if they can't deal with inflation, then this could have repercussions on what markets see the central banks doing for, like, decades to come. Absolutely. That's an excellent question, Francine. I'm going to point you to the retail sales data that came out earlier today. It did come in much higher than expected, obviously, earlier in the session. But if you look at the value versus the volume, you'll see that people are paying more for less. Now, even though that could have supported the argument that, oh, look, the economy is doing much better than we'd expected. Actually, if you look under the surface in the belly, you'll see, to Dan's point,
point that there is actually a lot more concerns about those inflationary pressures really being a lot stickier than the Bank of England is much more comfortable with at the moment. So unfortunately for the Bank of England, from a market's perspective, there is only one of two options, either keep hiking or, you know, continue on with the path that you've come in and really push forward. That ultimately, unfortunately, will impact the economy into what Bloomberg Economics, of course, expects a year-long recession, which, of course, doesn't bode well in comparison to the U.S. and the, the EU, where, of course, the rate differentials will play uh, much more in favor there. And then if we have inflation, let's say, at 3% and it kind yep. of gets stuck at 3%, can the BOE live with that? I, from my perspective, no, because you get to 3 and then you say, oh, I'm going to change the target. You lose your credibility and the whole idea of inflation expectations being bedded down, you just lose that. Because the next time there's an inflation spike, companies, households will be like, they get to 4, they're just going to change the target again. So you lose your anchor, you lose your nominal anchor in the economy. And going to Noor's point, you know, she, she quoted our forecast there. I think the easy bit will be getting down to sort of four, maybe three. The hard bit will be getting from three to two. And I think that's why what the former governor just said there is probably right. They're going to do more rather than less to make sure that they get to that 2%. But, but will the labour market hold? It's well, it's, so I mean, that's, I mean that's, the, that's the thing that they have to... That where this all ends is if consumers say to businesses, no, I'm not going to pay that higher price. If... if um, if workers feel worried about their jobs, the labour market starts to loosen, that sort of wage price spiral or price wage spiral, whichever way around you want to put it, that starts to break. And then the Bank of England starts winning the battle. But households have to feel concerned about the future. And that's why the consumer confidence data today is actually sort of an interesting thing. It sits against the retail sales data, but it's an interesting point that if that continues, it's at sort of recessionary levels now, if that continues, then I think, you know, you're going to get a change into the second half of the year in terms of the narrative around the economy. And hopefully, you know, with that, inflation will continue to come down. So interesting. Thank you both, Nora and Dan, for joining us. Dan Hansen, senior UK economist at Bloomberg Economics, and Nora Alali from our Bloomberg MLife team. Now, coming up, wheat is set to end the week with big gains on fears about Black Sea shipments. So we'll have plenty more on that next. And this is Bloomberg. <laughs> The good news on inflation is it's trending down. The Fed is really winning this war. They're not ready to declare victory. I think they're going to raise rates, it sounds like, one more time. And then they're going to hold them here for a longer period of time to try to slow the economy. And we expect they'll be successful in doing that. The Blackstone president and uh, COO Jonathan Gray speaking to Trinali Bazak about the fight against inflation. Now, wheat actually heading for a weekly gain of more than 10% on fears that growing threats to the Black Sea grain trade could curb supplies. Crude oil, meanwhile, set for its fourth weekly gain on signs of tightening supply. Now, joining us for the very latest is, of course, our uh, commodities at SAR. He's Bloomberg's Will Kennedy. Will, if you look, good morning, first of all, but if you look at wheat prices, how much more can they continue to rise given this this is geopolitics, this is like, you know, shelling, and so we don't really know where it ends up. Yeah, I think the shock this week was not only that the grain deal ended, which many people had seen coming, but that afterwards the rhetoric from Russia and then the Ukraine was so strong and Russia made clear with its attack on Odessa and its threat to sink Ukrainian uh, ships coming out of Ukrainian ports that it wasn't going to allow those exports to continue and the market reacted quite strongly. The upside from here may be limited because I think the wider picture and my colleague on opinion Javier Blas read a very good column about this morning is that fundamentally the global market for wheat is fairly well surprised, supplied and a lot of that is uh, Russian wheat uh, where the harvest looks very strong and exports look very strong. I suppose the one joker in the pack might be if Ukraine were to follow through on its threat to attack Russian ships, uh, that could see prices go higher, but that would be a big escalation. Yeah, that would be almost like all, all bets are off. When you look at oil prices, like what's moving the markets right now? I think we're in a tug of war. On the one side, you've got the increasing impact of the Saudi a million, dollar, uh, million barrel cut in uh, July and August, as well as signs that Russia is finally curbing exports, pitted against continued weak economic data from China, which of course tends to be the big driver of demand. Um, at the moment, I think the concerns about constrained supply are winning out, so you've got the fourth weekly gain, as you pointed out. 
but I think further gains may be capped as people watch just how quickly the Chinese economy slows. Will, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Of course, he's our head of commodities. Will Kennedy there in Barbie pink shirt, I would add. I'm not in Barbie pink. Will definitely is. Coming up, shares fall in Norsk Hydro after the European aluminium giant raises its capital expenditure guidance for the full year. We'll be discussing all of that with the chief financial officer, Paul Kildemo. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. Now, the yen extended its decline after Bank of Japan officials see little urgent need to act on yield curve control for now. The UK Prime Minister suffers a double defeat, losing two Conservative seats in special elections but avoids a whitewash. The pound gains on stronger than expected retail sales. Plus, the US Federal Trade Commission pauses its trial against Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard. Later, we'll speak to the UK regulator standing in the way of the takeover. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Norris Hydro shares are lower after the European aluminium giant raised its capital expenditure guidance for the full year. Well, the company is also asking the London Metals Exchange to reconsider banning Russian supplies over fears that large inflows could actually distort the global benchmark. Let's talk to the Norris Hydro's chief financial officer, his pal, Kildemo Pal. Thank you so much. For joining us, when you look at margins going forward, when you look at some of the difficult issues you're facing, what worries you the most? Well, in, in general, we, we see demand falling quite a lot uh, year over year. Um, and um, that is, uh, of, of course, concerning as it will impact uh, profitability going forward. But we operate in a cyclical uh, industry. Um, so this is something we, we are well uh, used to. I think what one area of concern uh, currently uh, is what you, you touched upon. Uh, it's the amount of uh, Russian metal uh, that is uh, coming into to our system and basically uh, mm -hmm. being sold at the discounted uh, levels uh, to, to normal aluminium. And we are at the current uh, running the risk of having uh, two uh, separate uh, markets, uh, one for those uh, self-sanctioning and one for those who, who doesn't do it. And for us at this quarter, uh, it's a cause of concern uh, that the LME um, allows uh, Russian metal uh, to continue to be mm -hmm. traded there because we are scared that uh, the LME uh, might lose its uh, reference uh, as uh, an indexing price uh, for aluminium. So, uh, about give me a sense. You've reported ongoing weakness in the demand outlook right, for aluminium this quarter, especially in building and construction. H have you seen any declines in orders? For building and construction, we, we've seen big um, de declines. Uh, building and construction in extrusion, for example, uh, is uh, down 20% uh, uh, plus uh, on an uh, annual uh, basis. So that's really uh, the uh, weak uh, segment uh, across the portfolio. The areas which are seeing more strength uh, is typically uh, automotive uh, and also uh, heat, heat uh, or um, elements uh, which goes into um, uh, ventilation uh, and, and those segments, and also uh, everything uh, which supports the green transition, so solar, renewables and the like. Uh, Pal, you've also outlined your concerns about the concentration of Russian aluminium to the London Metal Exchange warehouse network, of course, which it now stands at over 80%. Talk us through your thinking and what the response so far has been. Well, our thinking is that um, at the, the LME should act as a, uh, as a reference uh, price uh, for the whole uh, of the, the industry. And at the moment, uh, we're in a situation uh, where uh, there's two types of, of metal. Uh, it's the Russian uh, metal, uh, which uh, a large part of the industry can't buy uh, because they've been self-sanctioning, which is uh, sold at a, a discount to, to normal metal. And when the LME continues uh, to allow uh, the storage uh, of uh, Russian uh, aluminium at its inventories, now at an 80% level, Basically, uh, as a consumer, if you go to the LME uh, to buy metal, you may uh, end up uh, getting uh, Russian uh, aluminium and you can't uh, take it. So we're scared that the LME uh, will uh, lose its uh, role uh, as the, the reference yeah. index. And that's but why we've asked them to reconsider their position. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, concretely, what can the LME or its regulator do about this? Well, 
I guess back in October uh, 2022, um, they, the LME uh, had uh, a questionnaire uh, to the different participants uh, on the index asking uh, if they, what they believe they should do uh, with Russian aluminium, where uh, sanctioning or not uh, allowing it uh, to be part uh, of the, 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 the trading system was one of the alternatives. They decided against that at that point in time. Then Russian metal was a small part uh, of the total tonnage stored. Now it has increased uh, significantly. This causes concern for us because it's a reference in all our contracts, and that's why we've asked mm -hmm. them to reevaluate this situation. Uh, Val, like many aluminium smelters in Europe, you also curtailed some of the output during the energy crisis. If prices stay at these levels, would you kickstart them again? If you look at the whole aluminium industry uh, in Europe, f over 50% of capacity is curtailed. You have two more curtailments in the current quarter. If you look to, to, to Russia, uh, it, it keeps uh, increasing capacity and there's an increase in exports uh, into to Europe. And the reason uh, why these smelters are curtailing is due to the high energy prices, which is a direct impact uh, of the, the, the ongoing war. We don't see uh, that there's a large risk of restarted capacity uh, now. Uh, in China, they, they are restarting, but on Europe, there's probably a uh, further risk of, of further curtailments. We have around 130,000 tons out. We could restart it. It would make sense uh, from a financial perspective, but there's not a market uh, for that metal at the moment. The metals markets are in oversupply, so we are not uh, currently planning to restart either. No. Uh, there, you could have actually joined a, a tender to develop an offshore wind project in the North Sea through Hydro Orion. You decided not to be part of that. Why? Well, the world needs more uh, renewable hydropower, and we will continue uh, to develop uh, renewable hydropower uh, in our Hydro Rain uh, business uh, unit. Uh, but if you look at the total uh, portfolio uh, of projects uh, within uh, that. Uh, their, um, the, the, that company, then we have more uh, interesting opportunities which will bring power shorter in time and at uh, better uh, returns uh, for uh, Hydro Rhein. And so, uh, what does that mean going forward? If you look at the, you know, the, the main factors in future decisions of tender, is that likely to change? Well, we, we will still uh, evaluate uh, projects uh, within um, the offshore uh, wind space, uh, but uh, those uh, projects that look most likely for us going forward uh, are either onshore wind uh, or uh, solar. If you look at the hydropower energy generation in Norway, what's it looking like this summer? Is it better than last year? <laughs> Well, uh, it, it is actually uh, much better than, than last year, which means that the summer in Norway uh, is poorer than last year. Uh, we have uh, wet, uh, wet and cold uh, conditions now uh, from a, a, a historical perspective. So the reservoirs are more at normal levels, whereas last year we were well undersupplied. So, so energy prices have come significantly down in the, the Nordic areas. All right, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Paul Kildemo there, the Chief Financial Officer of Norsk Hydro. Coming up, it's a big day for the cinema. It's a big day for Barbie, in case you didn't know. We'll discuss the internet phenomenon called Barbenheimer. That's a mishmash of Barbie and Oppenheimer. A lot of young, cool people are seeing them back to back. So we speak to the founder and chief executive of View, one of the UK's largest cinema chains. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is a pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, it's a big day for cinemas as the movie meme taking the internet by storm hits the silver screen. Greta Gerwig's Barbie and Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer both opened today in the UK, US, and many other countries, something that's been dubbed. Barbenheimer. Now, while it is expected to be a very big day for the box office, productions across the globe have come to a halt as Hollywood actors also continue their strike over pay and the use of AI. So we are delighted for, well, to be joined by this wide-ranging conversation, really from Barbie to strikes by Tim Richards. He's the founder and chief executive of one of the UK's largest cinema chains, View. Tim, first of all, thank you for joining us. Which one are you seeing first, Barbie or Oppenheimer? I've seen both. Um, and I'm going to go back and see them both again. And I, uh, I, I realized before I got on, I probably should have been uh, supportive and worn my pink shirt. Um, but I mean, it's extraordinary <laughs> when you look at 
You know, if you walk around London right now, in fact, if you walk around large parts of Europe, you see people wearing pink in support of this film. It's this cultural phenomenon. I mean, I was on with our team in Italy this morning, and you've got you've got this this kind of like crowds lining up in Milan and Rome wearing pink, and not something you normally see. Pink? I don't, I don't know who would wear pink, uh, Tim, given I'm, I'm never in pink and I'm in like, you know, very bright pink. Um, Tim, how do you explain this phenomenon? So I don't know whether people want a bit of fun, whether COVID's changed the way that people see memes. I don't know why it's captured the imagination of so many people. Well, I think, I mean, a large credit has to go to Warner Brothers. I mean, I think they've done a phenomenal job marketing it, using social media. Um, and, and we've seen, and, and we saw what Universal did last year with Minions, with a gentle Minions phenomena. And um, it just shows when you, when you actually use social media and promoting and marketing films properly, what can happen. But it's also, it's a great movie. I mean, I mean everyone kind of either knows or grew up with Barbie. And, uh, and I think Greta Gerwig really kind of just captured something in this film. Um, Margot Robbie, I mean, she was born to be Barbie. Uh, and Ryan Gosling is was actually had to be Ken. I mean, you see the two of them together, the chemistry with the two of them. But this is a movie that that I mean, Greta Gerwig's done such an incredible job because everyone that sees that movie will come out of it with a slightly different takeaway. It's got so many different layers, mm -hmm. and it's it's and and I think that's why it's going to do so well. This is a movie that the advanced bookings right now are higher than Avatar two. This is this is going to be our biggest day post pandemic no. um, in two and a half years. So, Tim, I, I was going to ask you, is this for the double feature of Barbie and Oppenheimer? Or is it mainly Barbie? Like how many people are actually going to see the two films back to back? Well, 23 percent of our customers, which is an extraordinary number, um, have actually booked both movies to see them. And a lot of them are back to back. And, and then there's this amazing kind of social media debate. Do you see Oppenheimer first or do you see Barbie first and and kind of the repercussions of seeing those at different times. But I think, I mean, you know, Oppenheimer is, you know, probably one of Chris Nolan's best films. I mean, it is, you know, when I walked out of that movie, I just thought, like, why hasn't someone told this story before? Um, and it happens to be all true, too. But he's he's done kind of this incredible job in bringing Oppenheimer to life. And it's an unbelievable story. So the two of them together, uh, but but also, I mean, don't forget, you know, this is also joining Mission Impossible. You know, Tom Cruise's latest, absolutely kind of breathtaking two and a half hours <laughs> hold on to your but, seat movie. So there's a lot Tim, of great when films you look, over there. I know, but if I, so I was reading when you look at Mission Impossible, and actually I was speaking to our, our film buff, Sarah, here, Mission Impossible, Indiana Jones, maybe underwhelming a little bit in terms of expectations and how many ticks are actually booked. So what do audiences want? Is it the social media kind of trend experience? Like what makes, you know, someone choose one movie, not the other before it comes out? Well, I think, I mean, um, it, it, the one thing that hasn't changed in the last three or four years, and there's been a lot written and discussed about it, I mean, our audiences never left us. Um, they were with us the whole time. They just didn't have movies. And, and I think what we've seen in the post-pandemic era is we've seen every single demographic group from young to old to ethnic, all genders, everyone has come back to the movie and uh, to movies. But you've always had movies that performed. Some of them have been performed more or less than others, and some of them have been disappointing. And I think you know, it's fair to say Indiana Jones, I think, was a, maybe a little bit disappointing, even though it's a great movie. And I think people who go and see it love it. Um, and Mission Impossible, you know, for us, it's tracking to be Tom Cruise's biggest Mission Impossible in the franchise. Um, and I yeah. think it's all going to get a bounce this weekend. Um, Tim, when you look at the strikes, of course, in Hollywood, it's early days. But do you worry about the pipeline of movies coming out that, again, there won't be enough? No, I mean, I look, the strikes are unfortunate timing, but um, I, I think that, you know, I worry more about kind of, you know, our customers have come back and, and I think that this might slow down the recovery a little bit, which, which is not ideal timing. But, um, you know, I, I think fortunately the big summer movies, you know, the Barbies and the Oppenheimers and the Mission Impossibles and, and a few others have all been marketed and promoted and released. So, you know, we're in good shape for the summer. And, and I think, you know, this fortunately only happens every 40, 50 years. 
Um, and, yeah. you know, we're hoping that this will have a quick resolution. Tim, I always ask the tough questions, and I really need an answer on this. Barbie or Oppenheimer first? Like, when you, what, 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 do you, what did you see first? Um, I saw Barbie first, but that's only because of the premier's dating. Um, they were back to back okay. Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a cop. So, so if answer. you were buying a ticket. <laughs> I don't, I mean, it's, it is, they are both such genuinely amazing movies, and they're so entertaining that I don't think it matters what order you see it in. I think it's just seeing them both as well. So I I, um, okay. I would probably, I don't know, I'd, I'd probably start with Oppenheimer only because I just thought it was just such an incredible movie. There you go. Oppenheimer first, and then you can finish with a bit of pink to maybe lift your mood. Tim, thank you, as always, for joining us. Tim Richards, founder and chief executive of View International. Now, coming up, Spain heads to the polls on Sunday. We discuss what's at stake next. We're live in Madrid, and this is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is a Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, sticking with elections, Spanish voters are heading to the polls on Sunday. The current Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, seeking a re-election, but he does face opposition from the country's Conservative People's Party. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Rodrigo Orihuela in Madrid. Rodrigo, what are current Prime Minister Sanchez's chance right now? Prime Minister's chances, based on the last exit poll, uh, sorry, the last polls which were published on, on Monday uh, before the blackout started, um, his chances don't look good based on those polls. He, he has been trailing the, the Conservative PP for, for months, I mean, for weeks since he called the election. And the combination that we're seeing, uh, we saw in those polls of the PP with the far right party Vox would give them the possibility of forming a government. He, Sanchez, has been going on a, on a media blitz to do interviews and try to win over some voters who either left his party, who weren't going to turn out to vote, or who have switched to the PP. We, we are to see what kind of impact that has had, though, yet. So what are the issues actually facing the Spanish public? Excuse me, could you repeat that? Sorry. So in terms of the issues facing the, the Spanish public, I imagine yes. the cost of living Sorry. crisis, inflation concerns, is there yes. anything else that we should be watching out for? Yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, so the economy was uh, expected to be the, the key driving theme of the campaign. It was not in the end. Um, what ended up being the, the central part of the debate was cultural issues, mainly around gender, uh, gender issues, trans rights, and, and some identity politics issues. The, as you say, the, the regional nationalisms and the policies around them were also a key part of the campaign, but it really, really centered on a sexual consent law that was passed here on trans rights, on women's rights, and those were the things that really got fired up and were pushed and driven and, and set the agenda by, by Vox's, Vox's view of what had to be the, the debate, and it ended up being the debate, in fact. Rodrigo, thank you so much, of course, for the terrific briefing, and we'll follow this very closely. Uh, good luck for, for you and the team for, for all of this election coverage. Rodrigo Orihuela in Madrid. Now, Yen extending declines today after a Bloomberg scoop that the Bank of Japan officials are said to see little urgent need to act on yield curve control for now. It comes ahead of a major week of central bank decisions and a lot of earnings. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Valerie Titel. Valerie, uh, good morning, first of all. So let's start with Yen. I mean, this was, it, it was a huge deal. It's a Bloomberg scoop. Our team on the ground have been working tirelessly to get this information. What was the danger if they were going to tweak the yield? And look, if they were going to tweak yield curve control, you have to worry about this bond rally perhaps coming to an end because a tweaked yield curve control would release a bout of turn premium into the market, leading yields higher, not just in Japan, but globally. It would also strengthen the, the end. So now that we've gotten this scoop uh, with those BOJ officials seeing little need to adjust yield curve control next Friday, we're seeing a, a very decent move lower in the Japanese yen. Dollar yen rising 1.3%. And Francine, that just shows you 
how much was priced in for that meeting yeah. on Friday. That's what it reveals. Yeah, and I guess the concern is that if they start tweaking yield curve control, then it also gives the indication that actually they could change policy. So maybe they're worried that that communicates something they didn't want to. Yeah, perhaps a, a tweak of yield curve control. The market jumps ahead of itself and thinks that they're going to start guiding for a hiking cycle, start lifting those front-end interest rates, which have been negative for so long. And a lot of that would really cause maybe some other problems to other positions you have if, if you think uh, there's going to be cuts on the board for the Fed that could uh, that position could be rattled just by a, a Bank of Japan tweak. And next week is a huge week. And so, I mean, a lot of central banks. A lot of central banks. We get the Fed, the ECB, and then, of course, the BOJ on Friday. For the Fed and the ECB, wildly expected for them to raise rates 25 basis points. But for, for both of them, it's all going to be about the nuance on the path ahead. Does Powell still hint about this other rate hike in the cards later this year? Or perhaps does he give some consent to that really soft CPI print last week and maybe use that term disinflation is here like he did back in January? For the ECB, do they strike a less hawkish tone? We had one of the most hawkish ECB, ECB members not wanting to talk about a Fed hike after July. So what does she say? What does Lagarde say about a hike past July? Does she mention September at all as being a live meeting or in the cards for another hike? And then so many earnings next week, especially S&P 500. Lots of earnings next week. Over in the U.S., it's the big tech names. We get Microsoft. We get Al uh, Alphabet. And then in Europe, uh, Europe especially, we get those um, uh, European bank earnings, most of them coming uh, next week, uh, including uh, Deutsche Bank and BNP at the uh, beginning of the week. Uh, I think a lot of people's eye is going to go to the, the U.S. tech earnings season as we've had Tesla and um, Netflix really disappoint uh, so far. What does the, the rest have to say after that? Do we continue that strength of, of earnings misses for big tech? Yeah, and Nasdaq actually a, a huge story. So watch out Monday for any moves after, you know, in, in the middle of a cycle, quite unusually, they're, they're changing the index. Yeah, a big rebalancing for the NASDAQ. It's all about reshifting, rebalancing away from that magnificent seven uh, that have left the rest of the NASDAQ in the dust. Uh, we'll see some of that rebalancing. Uh, maybe some of that price action uh, happened today in the markets. Maybe it was some of that uh, softening yesterday in tech stocks with these passive funds already getting ahead of themselves, already trying to reweight uh, their portfolios as well. But a big uh, reweighting for the NASDAQ. It does take place on Monday. Yeah. We have had it known for a few weeks now. NASDAQ announced it on July 3rd. So just how much has it already been priced into the markets is yet to be seen, but we'll see today. We'll find out today and maybe on Monday. Valerie, thank you so much. Valerie Titel there joining us on the latest market moves. So let's take a look at what else we're watching or actually what we're watching. Uh, 11.30 a.m. UK time, we'll get the latest interest rate decision from the Bank of Russia. Economists surveyed by Bloomberg expect a 50 basis point hike to 8% before the U.S. market opens. American Express will report earnings for the second quarter. The company expected to make a return to earnings growth after two consecutive quarters of declines. And last but not least, as we've been telling you, two big movies are out in the UK and the US. Yes, Barbie and Oppenheimer. Well, cinemas will be hoping for a boost to sluggish revenues from the highly anticipated releases. Up next, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition.